Hello, welcome back to Space Engineers on the Xbox. This is the third of a three-part series looking at starting the vanilla game without mining stone by hand. Space Engineers offers three bare-bones survival start options. The Space Pod, the Moon Rover, and the Planetary Lander. This third video is going to look at the Planetary Lander. In my opinion, the Planetary Lander start has some significant disadvantages compared to the Space Pod and Moon Rover especially if you want to minimize drilling stone by hand. The planetary lander is effectively immobile without any effective means of directional control. There are numerous examples and videos on other channels of building a gyroscope and a remote control to utilize the existing atmospheric thrusters for maneuvering. However, that requires a degree of control and experience that isn't available to most players. The planetary lander also lacks the extra components from non-critical blocks that are available with the other two starting pods particularly the number of large and small steel tubes, which cannot be manufactured by the survival kit. Don't get me wrong, the planetary lander is a very efficient design and more than adequate as an emergency landing craft, but it is missing some comforts that would bootstrap getting started on a planet. With that out of the way, let's review our objectives one last time. Number one, build a basic refinery. Number two, build a basic assembler. Number three, build the drill. Number four, build an ore detector. Lastly, we're going to do this using no more than one backpack load of stone. However, given the limitations that we discussed, we will be using that one backpack load of stone to jumpstart unlocking the required blocks in the progression tree. Okay, let's be about it. Let's start with a look at the progression tree. We're going to start with the landing gear to unlock seats, wheels, and control blocks, just like we did in the two previous videos. Then, instead of rebuilding a cockpit or control seat, we will build a remote control block to unlock tools, thrusters, and some weapons. Because we cannot move the pod easily, we will need to unlock the mechanical blocks, pistons, rotors, hinges, and merge blocks. We know from previous videos that these can be unlocked by building batteries, solar panels, or wind turbines. We cannot build the batteries without a basic assembler, and we need the mechanical blocks to more quickly gather the resources to build the basic assembler. So that's right out. That leaves us with solar panels and wind turbines. Let's take a look at what we need to build them. The small grid solar panel requires two steel plates, two construction components, four girders, one computer, eight solar cells, and one bulletproof glass. We can get everything except the girders, solar cells, and bulletproof glass from other blocks on the pod. The wind turbine is only available in large grid and requires 40 interior plates. 8 motors, 20 construction components, 24 girders, and 2 computers. The only thing we can't get from other blocks on the pod are the girders. Let's take a look in the production queue at what resources we're going to need in order to make the parts for both the solar panels and the wind turbine. The solar panel still needs the 8 solar cells and 4 girders, however. That's going to cost 8 kilograms of nickel, 16 kilograms of silicon, and 8 kilograms of iron. Alright, let's look at what we need for the wind turbine. 24 girders. That's going to cost 48 kilograms of iron and nothing else. Let's clear the queue and set the survival kit to start processing stone. Now we're going to go and get some stone from this nearby rock face. Holding the X button on the controller while pulling the right trigger will automatically pick up the mine stone ore and place it into our inventory. Inventory full. Okay, our pack is full. We have 3,100 kilograms of stone. Let's go get this processed. The survival kit was able to process that load of stone into 93 kilograms of iron, 7.44 kilograms of nickel, 12.4 kilograms of silicon, and finally 43.4 kilograms of gravel. Gravel is effectively a waste product from processing stone, even though it does have some uses later in the game. 
that 93 kilograms of iron is sufficient to build either a wind turbine or a solar panel to unlock the mechanical blocks. Unfortunately, we don't have enough nickel or silicon to build the required solar cells for the solar panel, unless we go get another load of stone, which violates one of our objectives. Looks like we're building the wind turbine. Let's get those girders ordered, and we might as well order up the computers too. They use a minimum of resources and will help speed up the process of building the drilling rig later. Let's start gathering additional components from around the pod. We're going to need the interior plates and construction components from the passenger seat. Before we grind it down, we need to make sure it's empty of any items such as our pistol and spare magazines. If we leave them in the seat when we grind it down, they will fall out and may interfere with placing other blocks in the future, or disappear into the planet and be gone forever. Let's go ahead and grind down and repair the landing gear in order to unlock the next tier of blocks from the progression tree. We'll also need the motors and construction components from this thruster, so we'll grab those while we're here. Finally, we'll need to grab the girders and computers from the survival kits so that we can build a wind turbine. We will place a couple of armor blocks to serve as a base for the wind turbine. Pressing the left bumper and pulling the right trigger activates the gravity aligned placement mode. This means our blocks will be lined up with the planet's gravity rather than our arbitrary plane and give us a perfectly level structure to build the turbine. We're going to make this platform two blocks tall to ensure that the wind turbine's 3x3 base does not intersect the ground nearby. Let's build the turbine and unlock some more blocks. With that done, we can see that we've unlocked the mechanical blocks in the progression tree. We'll grind down these blocks and head back to build a remote control to unlock the block tools so we can start mining. With that finished, we can verify in the progression tree that we've unlocked the block tools, thrusters, gyroscopes, and weapons. Alright, I'm going to take a minute to salvage some armor blocks from the pod, and we'll be right back. Okay, now that we have a little more room, we can start looking at the interior blocks. The small cargo container will help us unlock conveyor tubes, and conveyor tubes will in turn help us unlock connectors, in addition to being really useful for setting up the drill rig. With that done, let's clear out some blocks that we don't need right now. We're going to replace this small curved conveyor tube with a small conveyor junction so that we can build our drill rig off of that. Four small conveyor tubes will give us enough clearance to mount a drill on a rotor and hinge without worrying about collisions with the pod itself. Speaking of rotors, the most wanted update gave us a small grid, one by one advanced rotor that fits neatly here at the end of the conveyor tubes. The edge of the rotor is marked off in degrees so that we can align the rotor position visually. I like to set the rotor up so that the zero degrees is pointed to the right of the pod as we look at it from the front, and the 180 degrees is pointed to the left. This means that when the rotor is moving with the positive velocity from 0 to 80 degrees, it is pointed down toward the ground. The rotor head can be made functional with just the 12 steel plates. Those extra small steel tubes are not required, but would improve the rotor's durability. Now let's add a hinge. The hinges have a mark here on them which indicates directionality. Placing it this way with the marks on our left means that the hinge part will rotate toward our right away from the marks with a positive velocity. With the rotor and hinge set up this way, we can mine an area around the front of the pod that will end up being shaped like a partial sphere. Imagine cutting an orange in half, then cutting that half in half again. This is the rough shape of the hole that our drilling rig will create. We've got everything except the last three large steel tubes. Fortunately, we still have three th thrusters that we can get those tubes from to finish the drill. Inventory full. 
Okay, we're going to access the control panel through the O2H2 generator and start setting up the drilling rig. The first thing we're going to do is turn on our drill. Now we're going to set the velocity on our hinge to something fairly snappy. 0.5 RPMs should do that. We can see the drill moving toward us through the control panel already. Let's set the lower limit to zero degrees, that way we don't have to worry about the drill ever going beyond straight out from the pod. Finally, we're going to modify the name of the hinge by adding AA to the name. This will put the hinge at the top of the list along with the advanced rotor the next time we access the control panel. Now, we need to set up the advanced rotor. The first step is to set the upper limit to 180 degrees. We don't want the rotor to spin past this point because we know there isn't any stone to mine in the air. Next, we'll set the rotor's velocity. I found that 0.2 RPM seems to be a good balance for feeding the survival kit slowly enough that it can process the stone as fast as it's coming in versus taking a subjective eternity to complete an arc of rotation. Finally, we'll set the lower limit to 0 degrees. Again, anything past 0 would be pointing the drill into the air. With this setup, we can see that the drill will swing downwards in an arc. Once it reaches the end of the arc, we can adjust the hinge to swing outward and then reverse the rotor to mine the next slice of material. We'll come back to this shortly. In the meantime, let's go look at adding some storage for pod. Much like we did with the rover, we're going to add a medium storage container to the back of the survival kit to increase our general storage, as well as to catch any overflow from the drill to the survival kit. With that done, we need to adjust the drill to make the next pass. For the second pass, we can adjust the hinge outward by 30 degrees. This means lowering the maximum angle from 90 degrees to 60. With the hinge adjusted to 60 degrees, we can reverse the rotor to cut the next swath. When it gets to the end of this pass, we'll adjust the hinge one more time to 30 degrees and do it again. Alright, let's move on and get the 3x3 advanced rotor into place at the back of this thing so that we can start subgrading to a full-sized refinery. We have most of the parts available already, but we need to get a small seal tube from the beacon. If we grind it down and back up to just pass functional, we can unlock antennas before we remove it completely. Alright, that does it for the rotor. Now we need to build a cradle, just like we did on the rover to help catch and align the large grid rotor head. Alright, with some steel plate, let's start by building out two blocks, then extend this four blocks, and we're going to repeat this on the other side as well. With the two sides done, we'll need to build out from the bottom. Using the jetpack to hang upside down makes it a lot easier to add the second block here. We'll come out the same four blocks that we did on the sides, and then we'll build up a short post and angled guide to help move the large rotor head into position. This angle gives us a better view of the completed cradle. Before we set up the timer block, let's go extend the drill rig. We're going to remove the drill and extend it by five small conveyor tubes, or roughly two and a half meters. It's been my experience that trying to extend the rig by more than this amount in a single step significantly increases the risk that the drill will catch on the voxel that can't be mined fast enough to clear a path for the drill to move through. This binding could lead to damage to the rotor and or hinge, causing the drill rig to collapse. Alright, with this done, you can see how much further the drill can reach compared to where it already mined. Now we'll go back to the control panel and reset the hinge to 90 degrees and reverse the rotor to start mining the next layer. Alright, with that done, let's get the timer block set up to attach the new large rotor head. Select and click on the eye icon to reveal the hidden blocks and find the timer block near the bottom of the list. Highlight and select the Setup Actions button to open the toolbar config menu. 
Highlight the advanced 3x3 rotor and press the A button to open the menu. Use the direction pad to move down the list to the attach option and press the A button to add it to the toolbar below. Then press the B button to exit and use the direction pad to highlight the timer block. Press the A button to open the menu. Use the direction pad to highlight the trigger now option and press the A button to add it to the toolbar below. Exit out of the menu and the toolbar config back to the control panel. Highlight the trigger now button and press the A button on the controller to start the timer block. Just like the rover, it is as if someone is constantly hitting the attach button over and over. Let's go drop a rotor head. We need to be pretty much right over the cradle so that we can drop the rotor head into it. Make sure that the large grid version is selected as you maneuver it around and line it up. When you're ready, pull the right trigger to create and drop the rotor head into the cradle. With any luck, it will lock up, just like that. Now we're going to grind down the cradle and use the steel plate to weld up the rotor head. With the rotor head welded up, we're going to access the control panel and set the drill rig for the next pass. Last time, we adjusted the hinge by 30 degrees for the second rotation, but now that the arm is longer, 30 degrees will leave a gap. This time, we're going to adjust it by 15 degrees, from 90 down to 75, then reverse the rotor. While the drill rig is getting its materials, let's set the large rotor to 0 degrees so that when we add large grid blocks, they are aligned with our pod. With the rotor locked at 0 degrees, we can add the refinery and order the components up from the build planner. We'll come back after that's done so we can weld up the refinery and add the basic assembler. Now that the refinery is done, let's mount the basic assembler high on the back just like we did on the rover. This gives us access to the conveyor ports and gives us room to add a small cargo container for storage. Give me a moment to order up the parts for these and get them welded up. There, the cargo container is done. We've completed all of our manufacturing blocks. The drill rig is plowing along nicely and you can see the quarter sphere shape more clearly now. Finally, the pod has an ore detector, so we don't need to build that. Let's go up top. We have successfully achieved all of our goals for this video. Build a basic refinery. Check. Build a basic assembler. Check. Build a drill. Check. Build an ore detector. And we didn't need that as it was already part of the pod. Last but not least, we were able to do this by mining only one backpack load of stone. It is possible to do this without mining any stone by hand, but without access to the mechanical blocks, doing so involves building and rebuilding the drill over and over, lowering it one block at a time. Each of these iterations would produce less stone than the engineer was capable of carrying, and would have been just as tedious as mining the thousands of kilograms of stone entirely by hand. So I'd call a single backpack load of stone a fair compromise for speed and efficiency. At this point, there's only one thing left. Since we've already done it for the space pod and the moon rover, we might as well remove the respawn tag from the landing pod as well. Looking at our respawn pod, we can see, barely, that the only part touching the ground are the three landing gear on what remains of the original pod here on the right. Space Engineers treats a locked landing gear very similarly to being embedded in the ground or voxel in many ways. The most important way, for our purposes, is that it will not remove the respawn pod designation if we were to merge to an embedded grid, like we did for the rover and the space pod. In fact, in order for that to work at all, we need the pod and the attached large grid blocks to be completely disconnected from the ground. Unfortunately, if we release the landing gear right now, the whole mess is going to flip up and back onto the production blocks and possibly roll over. To overcome this, we will build an outrigger frame similar to what we did on the rover, along this line here. We'll attach landing gear to the corners to provide support. Give me a minute to do that, and I'll be right back. Okay, here's the finished outrigger. As you can see, it runs the full length of our combined grid on both sides. Let's go release the landing gear now. In the control panel, we want to select all five landing gear. Use the direction pad to highlight and select the first landing gear. Then, while holding down the A button and the right bumper, Use the direction pad to move up the list, highlighting all of the landing gear. Go ahead and release the A button and the right bumper. Use the left stick or direction pad to highlight the auto lock option and press the A button. With the auto lock disabled, we can press the unlock button to release all five landing gear simultaneously from the ground and not worry about them automatically relocking. Hopefully the grid will settle to the ground reasonably gently 
everything looks intact and the yellow bands indicate that the landing gear are all ready to lock, but haven't yet. Let's go build another anchor point for a rotor. Rather than trying to freehand position the rotor so that it aligns with one of the blocks, we're going to borrow a trick from the space pod and convert our large blocks into a station. First, we need to lock the landing gear to the ground so that we know nothing is going to move. Yes, we did just unlock the gear, but now that the combined grid is settled, we want to align with its current position rather than the idealized position that it was in earlier. Hold the control panel and select all five landing gear like we did previously. Highlight the lock option and press the A button to lock every gear that we can. Good, we can see that some of the gear has a green band indicating good lock to the ground. Now open the control panel on the cargo container and pull the right trigger until we open the info tab. In the lower left corner you can see the option to convert to station. Press the X button to do that. The indicator should change to convert to ship and it is a good way to verify that it worked. With the large grid block converted to a station, we can now build an armor block off the bottom of the basic refinery and have it stick partially into the ground. From here we're going to build a small platform to build our large rotor onto. By building off the existing blocks, we can be confident that the rotor will line up with our existing grid with little to no fuss. With the platform built, we need to cut away the blocks that connect it to the basic refinery so we have separate grids again. With the grids separated, we can convert our production blocks back into a ship. Let's get this large grid rotor placed and grind off the rotor head. We need to build a control panel so that we can access the rotor controls and add a small rotor head and then activate the rotor lock to keep it from moving. With all of that done, we need to build a docking arm with a merge block onto the rotor and an aligned arm and merge block on the landing pad. Don't forget to unlock the landing gear before building the merge blocks or this won't work. With the merge blocks placed, we can see that they're pretty close to aligned. Unfortunately, the one that's attached to the rotor is lower than the one attached to the landing pod. When these two merge lock, the landing pod will be pulled into the ground and likely end up damaged. We can avoid this by going to the rotor's control panel and adjusting the rotor displacement setting. Let's go ahead and set it to maximum and see how everything lines up. That's much closer, and now the merge block attached to the rotor is ever so slightly higher than the merge block attached to the landing pod. Let's finish welding them up and they should automatically connect, like that. Okay, did it work? We'll try adding an armor block to the landing pod. Look, no warning about the respawn pod being removed. Not convinced? One more proof. With the rotor welded up, it's getting power from the landing pod, and we can set it to spinning. There, the landing pod is moving, but the respawn tag isn't. Now we know that the respawn pod, the landing pod, is safe from being deleted if we were on a server and we logged off. I hope you've enjoyed this series, and would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. We'll be back with more videos soon. Until then, have a great game everyone.